Awesome. I think we can get started. How's everybody doing today? So far, so good. Everybody got lunch? And coffee so you don't fall asleep during this next session? <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. Um, my name is Charles Okochu. I am the Worldwide Business Development Manager for uh, our Amazon Managed Blockchain Service and Quantum Ledger Database. So I've been with AWS now for about three years, and I've you know, also worked previously at uh, cryptocurrency hedge funds and also in fintech. So uh, today I want to talk to you guys about building enterprise applications using Amazon Managed Blockchain Service. So let me first of all dive into how we at AWS think of blockchain. Um, blockchain obviously is a technology that everybody you know, is, it's been uh, very, very popular. Lots of companies are trying to find out specific use cases on how to use blockchain and how to, when, you know, when, when is a good use case for blockchain. And technically, yeah, usually we have like two different types of uh, what we call ledger technologies that we support. Uh, the first is, you know, when you have like a centralized trust. And in, in that case, we've we discovered that there are a lot of customers who think they want blockchain, but technically what they want is a uh, system of record, a centralized system of record with an immutable ledger. And they want, but they don't want the information to be uh, uh, distributed among this other parties and they want to have, to, you know, manage that data by themselves. But they still want an immutable, immutable, immutable ledger. So in that case, we have a service called Amazon Quantum Ledger Database which is a fully managed service that makes it easy to create and, you know, uh, and provide a centralized ledger technology for managing uh, data. And this slide here shows how uh, QLDB works. Tech, ideally what happens is data is fed in and it's fed into a journal, which is an immutable journal. And that information is stored in a sequence uh, cryptographic database. And it just same way as it's stored on a blockchain. And then the data is now um, provided to customers in a, you know, in, a, in a view called the current state view and an index view. So it gives you the ability to look at versions of, of history in the, of the application. Um, so we see a lot of use cases for this particular type of database uh, from customers who, like the Department of Motor Vehicles in the US, um, the DVLA here in, uh, in the UK. And for a lot of customers, this is a good enough uh, solution for a immutable ledger without having to use a blockchain solution. So then we also have um, a decentralized trust, ledgers with decentralized trust. With this type of technology, it's more suited for companies that have complex workflows. If you're, you know, you, want, you have like different number, uh, customers who want to interact with each other in a trustless fashion. And, and in, for, for these type of companies that are multi-party, we, we look, think, think of solution, uh, applications like supply chain, decentralized identity use cases. This works best. And for that, you know, that's where we see blockchain being a, a, a good use case. And we, all, we have a service called the Amazon Managed Blockchain, which is a, uh, it's a solution that offers the ability to build and run uh, any blockchain framework. Tech currently, we support um, Amazon, uh, the Hyperledger Fabric, as well as managed Ethereum nodes. So it's very easy to kind of build on our AWS platform. It's, you know, if you're trying to build a Hyperledger-based network, rather than having to build all the nodes and, you know, yourself, it's easy to kind of run in the application, focus on building your core business application and running uh, the network on, on our platform. So I'm going to dive in briefly into uh, blockchain fundamentals. Uh, so first of all, one of the things that we've seen from customers is they've, they've reached out to us and said they want a way to independently verify transactions. They don't necessarily want to run the applications on their own. They want us to manage the uh, build of the data set of the, of the uh, blockchain network. And currently, the approaches that are used are focused on building the nodes, you know, managing it. It's very, very um, difficult to do that for most customers. So what we've come up with is a way to uh, build 
a infrastructure, you know, using our AWS services to build infrastructure to allow customers to kind of focus on their core business applications while we handle all of the undifferentiated, undifferentiated heavy lifting of the, of the blockchain. So in this case, you know, one of the things that blockchain offers is it helps you build trust in the network and eliminates the need for a central authority. And for most blockchains, you know, we, there are three main components. One is um, the distributed ledger, the consensus mechanism, and smart contracts. So together, these components provide a immutable and trust and enables multi-private transactions uh, without a centralized authority. Uh, <clears throat> so the first layer is the smart, you know, is the distributed ledger, which I talked about. Uh, and then you have the consensus mechanism, which I'll go into more details, and also smart contracts. So the first is the distributed ledger. So ledgers are typically used to record a history of uh, economic and financial activity. And many, many organizations, you know, like to want to build a ledger-like functionality because they want to maintain an accurate history of the applications. And, you know, and for, exam for example, for supply chain or tracking of credits. And in the, in the blockchain, the ledger is shared uh, and is trusted. And, and it's a, you know, and everyone, no one, no single user has control over the, over the ledger. And every node on the, in the blockchain replicates a date copy of the ledger. And now the way it does that is using a consensus um, mechanism, which form the backbone of the blockchain. And it helps all the nodes in the network to verify the transactions. And there are different, you know, types of uh, consensus protocols, obviously, you know, with Bitcoin, which is the grandfather of all blockchains, we, there's proof of, proof of uh, uh, work, and some of the newer blockchains use proof of stake for, uh, or proof of authority, depending on what you, uh, which blockchain network you're using. And so this, this is kind of, from our perspective, you know, we feel that we want to run blockchain networks that are energy efficient and are also environmentally uh, stable so currently we don't support Bitcoin but that's going to change over the next you know in the next few months uh, we, we support ethereum and we also support hyperledger fabric and last but not least is the smart contract which is business logic that resides on the blockchain and and smart logic you know smart contracts are simply applications or programs that are written in code that can be executed you know in a decentralized manner on, on the network so so currently, as I said before, the challenges that customers have reached out to us that they face is, you know, the fact that setting up a blockchain network is hard. Um, when you're thinking of adding new members or you're growing or growing your ledger, it becomes very hard to scale and it becomes more complicated to manage. You know, when you're managing the security, the governance, uh, billing, and also expensive. Uh, we've seen that a lot of customers who are running their blockchains tend to initially start running it on bare metal or hardware. And they have to manage all of the components associated with running that blockchain. You know, trying to run an open source blockchain network is not, is an, is not an easy task. So the service that we offer, obviously, is our Amazon Managed Blockchain, which is a fully managed service that makes it easy to create uh, managed scalable networks. And currently, we offer, like I said before, two main frameworks. One of them is the Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and also uh, the manage Ethereum. And we also support three of the uh, popular test nets, which is uh, RinkleB, uh, Robstein, and Gurley uh, on, our, on, our, on our platform. So the core here, the core features. So this slide here shows how easy, easy it is to get started. Um, it's in, you know, what I want to stress here is, you know, a lot of, you know, we've seen based on customer feedback that one of the beauty, you know, customers running Ethereum, for instance, they're able to get a blockchain network running. If you tried running, say, an Ethereum node, it takes about 24 to 48 hours to get a fully managed Ethereum node up and running. We're able to get the nodes up and running, uh, our Ethereum nodes, within an hour. And also, when it comes to creating a Hyperledger Fabric network and you know having with a consortium set up, it, the governance features of of uh, the current open source implementations are, you know, it's kind of onerous to kind of invite members to join. So we offer, a, you know, a governance platform that allows you to invite members or, you know, uh, create a voting mechanism to allow people to join in and, and leave the network. And the also other thing is we use for our ordering service, we leverage um, our own gov journal database instead of using Raft uh, or Kafka, which is 
someone can, you know, it's easy for somebody to break into or an administrator to break into a Kafka-based network or a Raft network and in, inject uh, messages. So we use uh, a, a QLDB technology, which is based on journal. Uh, it's an internal solution that's used within AWS to control or manage the ordering service on, on, um, on our blockchain. The other thing, obvious other feature here is it's, you know, it's low cost, you only pay for what you need to use and you can scale up and scale down as you, uh, as you grow, as you decide to. And it's also integrated with AWS services. Uh, I think I've already showed this slide before. So again, I wanna talk briefly about the two protocols that we support, obviously, and when to use them. Uh, if you are running on a hyperledger, you know it's ideally f ideal for permission networks, and you know this is a, this is great for applications that need privacy and access controls. Uh, they use HLF, and where you have a need to have transparency of data across all members, hyperledger, you know, Ethereum might be a better use case. And so we see a lot of use cases with banks and financial institutions that want to run trade and clearing and settlement, uh, settlement applications uh, for loyalty point solutions. Uh, we see a lot of use cases, which I'm, I'm gonna share over um, as we go along. And um, so the other question we get a lot is, who owns the network? Even though we run the, we run the underlying blockchain, we don't control the data. Uh, we make it possible for customers to kind of run their applications and they're able to invite other members or remove members within the uh, configuration, and each member pays for their resources. We don't, uh, we don't get access to the data because we kind of keep a separation in terms of controls over use of the, um, of who owns the network. So one of the things that we do to augment the Hyperledger Fabric, as I said before, is the component, components of the Fabric network to guarantee delivery and order. Instead of using Kafka or Raft, we, we leverage our KLDB journal DB uh, s solution to provide additional durability and reliability. And we can guarantee that, you know, if you're running, operating a blockchain network, part of the value proposition is you want, want to ensure that no one has tampered with the data. And what we've seen is from our experience, it's possible to actually modify the underlying Raft protocols or uh, uh, Kafka, which is what the, the legacy blockchain uh, open source network uses. So we, we leverage a, uh, a Amazon QLDB technology to increase the, that durability. And also our certificate authority uses a soft HSM. Um, and last but not least, we, use, we leverage our key management service to secure the uh, certificate authority service. And generally, you, you know, you might underplay the importance of this, but from our perspective, we see that a lot of implementations managing the uh, keys for a traditional blockchain network uh, using open source can be very onerous. I mean, we've seen one use case where a bank, a uh, central bank tried to build a central bank digital currency application, and they launched, and about a year later, all of the keys expired. And they were not able to, all the tokens were, you know, worthless at that point. So we kind of feel that using our key management service and also our soft HSM that we provide allows you to ensure that keys get generated and, and the certificates get renewed uh, automatically without you, know, you having to manage that aspect of it. So um, in terms of pricing, um, we do offer, as I said before, pay as you go with no upfront costs. And you know, there, are two, there are about four pricing dimensions. One is a network membership fee, which is per hour, and, and also the second dimension is the data that's transferred across between members. That's uh, paid written per gigabit. And then you have like peer nodes that you provision per hour, and also node storage. So those are kind of the four main pricing dimensions, and we've done a lot of work of managing and pricing for different members, so customers don't have to do anything. Now, if you're starting out building a plot, building a uh, application, you know we'd recommend using our starter edition, which is used for small uh, tests um, and production networks. We're using very small instance sizes, and we provision this for you know beta test environments, and also, and then once you're at the point where you built out the POC, you want to move to a production network. We offer a standard edition, which is for production-based network. And in addition to that, we also offer uh, credits to allow customers who are looking to build applications on on our blockchain to 
test it out to try to make sure they can, you know, they're happy with the service before they move forward. And one of the things that we have seen, like from customers who leverage our blockchain service, we find that it's um, up to 75% cheaper than running it yourself on, on EC2. So there's a lot of value proposition. We have lots of customers, who, like, you know, which I'll, I'll show some of the customer stories who've tried doing it, building their own uh, Hyperledger Fabric networks, for instance, and, you know, or Ethereum networks, and they found uh, it much cheaper to leverage our managed solution. So let me talk briefly about a few customer stories. Uh, one of them is Nestle. And Nestle, about a, two, a year and a half ago, built a uh, supply chain asset tracking system to track coffee from the farm all the way to the, the uh, store. And, you know, the, the idea was to kind of keep track of, you know, basic ESG type um, feature, uh, uh, metrics like carbon water footprint, and they were able to track where the coffee was, was um, produced a lot and track it all the way from the roasting, um, the grading, all the way to the store. So you can actually scan a QR code on the coffee bag and it will tell you how long and where the coffee came from, w you know, the origin, the original, uh, where, the f where it was farmed, and also it can also give you, it give, gives them more information as to where they're seeing delays in their supply chain network. And so this is something that they've launched uh, out of Australia and they're now beginning to expand it across um, other parts of the world. So you're going to be seeing more of this. And this was built with our professional services team within three months. So this is one great use case for supply chain. Another use case um, that I wanted to share is, let's see, is Sony Music. And this they built a uh, digital rights management solution on uh, on our Amazon managed blockchain solution. They were able to use it for participants to share and verify information. And if you look at the legacy um, implementation, you know, there was a lot of contracts flowing back and forth between the originators of, of the content, you know, the people who, the artists and, um, and authors of, you know, music or any digital rights. And the, the paper flow was very, very complex, and they were able to use the blockchain to kind of provide a decentralized platform for publishers uh, and, and artists to actually leverage this solution for, for managing their digital rights and ensuring they get paid in a timely fashion. And one of the benefits, you know, it helps sim simplify the complex uh, contract workflow. It helped them reduce management and labor costs, and each member of the network can now update an, an immutable data set of contracts. So looking at all of the uh, music contracts, you know, that, that have been written, you know, keeping track of who owns what and also when, say, the musician dies and hands over the, the, um, the, the copyrights to their descendants or, you know, benefactors, keeping track of all of that. So Sony Music, you know, in Japan is um, actively using that. And there was a recent, um, um, change in their in the copyright regulation in Japan uh, they're also going to be leveraging nfts for uh, for managing those uh, those um, rights and the other solution I was going to talk about was uh, the Singapore exchange um, and Singapore exchange is a you know leading multi-asset exchange in Asia uh, provides like listing and trading and clearing and settlement so they actually built the original uh, implementation on-prem using traditional open source um, hyperledger and the, when they were moving into the cloud they you know decided they were going to test out our platform and um, primarily the main use case was for um, to help with codifying rights and obligation for digital assets for a digital end-to-end -end marketplace and also to allow for interbank transfers interbank transactions between member banks for clearing and settlements of trades. Um, so they were able to move the existing implementation that were running on their on-prem onto our blockchain with all of the smart contract code, the, the chain code, everything got migrated within two, two months into uh, blockchain and it, it resulted in uh, about 60% savings on, on their part. So they've been using this and they're actually moving on to the next stage in the implementation which would be beyond for cross-border settlements, not just within Singapore, but across uh, Asia. So that's a, 
very successful use case, and they're using it for uh, clearing and settlement of, of assets on and for uh, in, in Singapore. So we have a bunch of other use cases that we have for customers, and um, like the DTCC for clearing and settlements, Liberty Mutual is using it for claims processing. Um, we have Health Direct for healthcare. Uh, a lot, lot of use cases there in healthcare, and so. If you are interested, you know, I'm definitely open. You can reach out to me. We have a, a, a booth upstairs. I can talk more about these cases. I've tried to kind of speed through as quickly as possible because I know I have like 15, 20 minutes and I also want to leave room for questions. So if you're interested in learning more about our services, you can you know, go to our Amazon landing page and also you can look at QLDB, amazon.com slash QLDB. So I'm going to leave the room. If, do we have any time for questions? I think I have like three, five. All right. Any questions on our services? Yeah, we, we do have the op option to store in a in a private HSM. We also have, a, obviously, the cloud HSM service on AWS that can be leveraged for that. Okay, so but that means, uh, to, simpl to simplify it for most customers who are just focused on, foc on the business value of the application and they don't want to deal with the HSM or, you know, managing key recycling, we just made it easy for customers to just launch. And then, you know, and again, like the use case I explained to you, the the bank in, in South America who they built out an entire central bank digital currency application using an open source hyperledger implementation, you know, they, they left out having to, you know, manage the key recycling. And that, you know, you don't worry about it until a year later when the keys start to expire. And at that point, you know, you start running into issues. So we've made it very, very easy. We try to, you know, le reduce the... Yeah. So, uh, how yep. to revoke the certificates after that, and also the physical access to the smooth keys, and these type of uh, challenges we have encountered, and it's quite good. Uh, if you, if in this case, uh, you are providing APIs to invoke uh, through the smart contract to the HSM, right? We provide like a SDK or okay. you know, a API for, to allow you manage it. Okay. And, but it sounds like this the kind of problem you're having, we can definitely. Uh, help you with that. So let, you can talk to me after this meeting. We'll talk more about it. Yeah, my question deals with: um, Are there any plans that you can share at this point? Uh, I know that Amazon has a number of certifications. So in terms of uh, being able to continue to build out your business, you had mentioned uh, your professional services, right? And of course, that's either with your partners or internal. Yep. But when Will Amazon, uh, that you may be able to share, uh, have some type of certification program for uh, these managed blockchain products that you have? That's a very good question. So your, your question you're asking is if Amazon is planning on having a, you know, a training and certification path for, for blockchain. Uh, the answer to that question is yes. We're, we're actively working on that, not just for um, internal, because obviously, Find, find, finding blockchain talent is very difficult. We have, a, you know, we're hiring developers and, and and professional teams to help in in helping customers implement their, you know. So we actually have a program like a what we call blockchain academy, which you know will be released and allow not just customers but also individuals and partners to get through a uh, to get a you know competency a blockchain competency. Uh, but right now, that's still in progress. Uh, obviously, we're going to be covering Hyperledger, Ethereum, and over the next six months, there are a few more blockchain protocols that are going to be out. So we're planning on releasing a training agenda for, for that and because that's a, that's a big part of, you know, uh, increasing the rate, rate of adoption for blockchain services. You know. So, yeah, that's something that's in our pipeline. 
you mentioned that um, you're going to adopt other um, blockchains. Uh, is there a plan for Hyperledger Bezu um, as an execution client on the mainnet? Um, yes. Yeah, so we, we are getting a lot of inbound from customers looking to use uh, Hyperledger Bezu, which is private Ethereum, as you know. Well, there's two. Yeah, you could run it as a, uh, as a uh, execution client on the mainnet or as a permission network as yeah. well. Yeah. Stage. So there, there is, you know, there are plans to support it. But I mean, right now we do the way we support Hyperledger Besu is, you know, we work with partners like Kaleido to offer an offer, you know, offer. Even though they don't have a managed service on AWS, they do have a um, what we call a quick start or a, a uh, on our APN. So you can go onto our marketplace, which is the Amazon uh, Partner Network marketplace, and you can click on the. Hyperledger, their Hyperledger Besu, and launch a Kaleido node. So that's something that we currently offer today, but looking at having it as a managed service is something that it's, it's probably going to be in our own. I can't go into too much details, but we're looking, we are looking to support at least six new blockchains we over the next... support Quorum as well right now, right? We don't Quorum. support Quorum. Quorum is on, on consensus, but they, there's also consensus... Oh, that's Quorum. right, they have their... They're on, on, the, on the marketplace as well. So for... The, for for networks that we currently don't um, have as a managed service, we basically give them the option. We partner with them, and also because there, there are a lot of use cases. An example is the uh, global rock star use case, where we built a music NFT platform on Ethereum. You know, they built. We work. They work with our, our professional services, but they also wanted the ability to run gasless transactions or low cost transactions. So we actually partnered with Polygon, for instance, to allow them mint assets on Polygon and then provide a way to, using ZK rollups to transfer those assets from cross-chain from Polygon back into Ethereum. So that's an example. But yeah, we have at least six blockchains that I think we're going to add to that list over the next few months. So you're asking if we see any challenges towards to proof of stake? Yeah. Funny enough, it's a good thing you asked that question. So we have a lot of customers who are running uh, Ethereum nodes today, or you know, and they're asking us to provide validate validation services. Most of the customers who are currently running Ethereum, one of the value propositions that we offer is they don't have to worry about updating. So all of our networks, all of our customers, I mean, one thing a lot of people don't know is like most, almost 40% of all the Ethereum nodes that are running in the globally right now are running on AWS. So most of our customers who are running Ethereum nodes today don't have to worry about anything. Like the entire upgrade process is going to be handled by our service team and everything gets done without them having to worry about it. So we're, we're closely tracking the, the updates that are coming, that's coming up over the next few days. And It's it's seamless, so it's a it's a gradual rollout because yeah, it's important to ensure that none of the nodes, you know, is out of up is up is out of date. So you know, because we want to make sure that we're keeping track. So as new updates are happening, like for instance, we recently updated uh, the Gurley testnet, you know, to support that about two three months ago, and. As you know, the other networks, Ropstein, and uh, will be taken down. So, as that's happening, we manage that. And if you were running the, those nodes yourself, you have to remember to go update it. You know when. So we just take away all of that stuff. You know, and then, so we're actually seeing a lot of adoption. You know, we are we're offering uh, you know credits for customers who are trying who want to try our network, and a lot of them are seeing the benefits of using our platform because they don't have to worry about all of the updates that come, you know, or rollbacks that have happened you know, over the next. Just get a notification maybe. Yeah, you just get a notification that your node has been updated and that's it. Cool. So, question? Uh, so 40% of your Ethereum nodes are done through Amazon managed blockchain or they're on ECT? There are some percentages of that 40 that are self-managed. So customers decide they want to run an Ethereum node, they go launch EC2 instances. But when you see that, you know, the cost of running it yourself, you actually save money by running it on a on, on a managed service. It's a no-brainer unless you have money to burn. So most companies are that are using it for 
um, events, streaming, so streaming events out of the Ethereum network, things like smart contract data or uh, token data are using, you know, they just focus on building on top of the, of the nodes and they don't want to worry about managing the network. They want a stable, reliable network. And that's kind of the other reason why we're seeing a lot of inbound for, to run validator nodes uh, because if you think about the way, you know, proof of stake works, if, you, if your node goes down for any reason, you get penalized. So you, you stake 32 Ether and if, you, if you're running those nodes, you lose electricity, you lose internet connectivity, if anything happens, you start getting penalized. And so for them, they just want to have a staking, physical node staking service and they just want to deposit their wallet and ensure that during that time period while it's being validated, while it's running, it stays as stable as possible so they don't get penalized. So that's kind of why we're seeing a lot of adoption of our service because we provide, you know, pretty stable. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty stable in terms of um, how our infrastructure compared to some of the other blockchains. And I'm not going to name names, obviously. So, yeah. I have a follow-up question. So for, uh, for instance, uh, people who are running their ECT nodes, they have to go and update their like they have to fork from GitHub and yeah. So like he's he yeah. as he said, if you are running an existing legacy Ethereum node and you need to update when the time comes, you yes. have to. If you're running EC2, you have to go in and actually update it. Go on GitHub, update it yourself. If you're running a managed node service, you just get a notification that it's been done, and that's the end of it. And as part of the Amazon blockchain managed service, does the region impact by any chance? So if obviously, we, when you're running a node, it's running within a specific availability zone and a specific region. So most of our customers run across multiple regions. So we support about four or five regions right now across the globe. So you know, we, there are customers who run maybe you know, two nodes per region and ensure that they're able to load balance traffic across all those regions. So if any region goes down or there's any issue in any specific availability zone or region, they can still continue to service their customers um, outside of you know, different regions. Because ultimately, because the blockchain network, the data is the same, right? It's the data, it's all replicated across all the nodes. So it doesn't really matter where the data is coming from, unless you're latency sensitive. Um, but for the most part, that's how most of our customers build their infrastructure. Yep. Um, so me and my friend, we, we still try to find answers to the, how it's possible to get over the regulation obstacles. For example, when Amazon wants to deal with the healthcare mm -hmm. industry, so it's still very hard to understand. For example, in the US, you have different states. So yes. does Amazon have any secret plan? How you can get over the obstacles, like the regulation obstacles? Because each state has different laws. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're asking, your question was relating to healthcare yeah. data and um, whether Amazon has a position in terms of how the data gets stored. And from our perspective, obviously, most of our services are built for, to, for HIPAA. I don't know if you guys, you know, if you're based on the US, you know what HIPAA compliance is. But as I said to you previously, uh, because the blockchain is immutable, there's some, I mean, it's great for storing data, you know, obviously, that you don't want to be changed. But if, because the blockchain itself is immutable, right, if you have a requirement to at some point, say, delete the data, like, you know, you might decide that as a patient, you don't want your data with a specific medical, if it's immutable, it's hard to do that. So generally, the reference architecture is you try, tend to not store PHI data on the blockchain because it's, there might be a requirement like here in, the U, in, the, in Europe, there's a GDPR which, is, which has a privacy laws or, that require you to erase the data after a certain time period or you, the patient, can decide to ask for the data to be erased. So the methodology that we recommend and we've seen a lot of healthcare life sciences companies who are in, deploying on AWS is to store the, the actual data on you know, S3, which is a um, uh, object store, and then store the hash and the location on the blockchain. And then you might put the patient ID information. That way, 
you don't have any PHI information like the patient name, last name, the social security card, or any of that information on the blockchain, but you do have a reference to the location. And you can, because you're storing the hash of the patient information that's on, on the S3, you can guarantee that that data has not been tampered with. And you can also enable what we call op, uh, S3 object lock, which ensures that the data can be, you know, you can create a life cycle to ensure the data can be deleted based on whatever regulatory uh, compliance frameworks that you find yourself. So that's generally what we see in, in industry. I mean, there's also going to be another um, uh, session tomorrow on healthcare uh, that's going to be hosted here. So you might uh, I recommend you attend that session. Uh, how much time do we have left? I think we're. Any other questions? Follow up question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, fine. If you're storing the hash on the chain and you archive the data through S3 lifecycle, mm -hmm. uh, do you think the same hash will be referred again in the future and you get something wrong? Well, if you have a lifecycle management solution in place and you store the hash on the blockchain, at some point you expect the data to be erased off S3. Once that's done, you can try to reference it but it's not going to be available. So yeah, because the hash will be changed with the new data. It's just not going to exist anymore. The object doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So it doesn't really matter. You know, you might still have the ha the hash, and also the hash is a much smaller target data that can be stored on the blockchain because technically you don't store large blobs of information on the blockchain. You store specific data. You don't store images or videos on a blockchain. You would store it. You know, and if you look at the way NFTs work today, the NFT. The actual image, underlying image or asset, is stored on IPFS or on S3, not on the blockchain, except you know very very rare instances. So in terms of uh, the storage utilization, it is uh, efficient approach. Yes, that's a, that's also the smart yeah. approach because trying to store data on the blockchain. Okay, I have uh, one more question and then then we're done. Go ahead. <laughs> On what? What's the question? On the trust assumptions. Uh, yeah, how much do I need to trust Amazon for? And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's a serious question. Like, Shots fired. Know, okay, fine. <laughs> just to understand better, like, sure. Um, like what I can control as a customer. And yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we get that a lot. So AWS has, you know. We obviously we're the largest cloud service provider, and you know one of the reasons why we are people are using us is because we do have like two levels. You know, we have a separation of data. There are certain things that we are responsible for. We are responsible for the underlying architecture, the uh, storage, compute, and space and power and heating. That's at a bare. You know, if you if you order EC2 or any type of AWS services, that's what we offer. One of the things that we do is obviously the, the underlying storage is encrypted, so we don't get access to your data. We leave the applications and also kind of the governance to you, the customer, to manage. We don't get in, we don't, you know, we, we, all of the data transferring from server to server or from node to node is all encrypted, and we don't get, we don't, we don't have access to the information. So from that perspective, you know, you can say that, yes, you're running it on AWS, but if we don't have access to the keys, and you... you tamper with the transaction data. For example, I try to read a transaction from a blockchain node running at Amazon, mm -hmm. and would it be possible for Amazon to tamper with the, with the data that I'm reading, or is it also cryptographic? No, it's cryptographic. Okay. And also, if it was tampered with, I mean, you still have... The information is stored on the... If it's stored on the blockchain, you can also validate that that data has been tampered with because the hash will change. So you can apply the additional control of checking the hash after you copy it, yeah. and validating the hash is consistent with the hashes that are stored on the blockchain. So that kind of helps you to, and that's why a lot of customers store information on the blockchain. They, they store it there so that we, they are trying to protect us from us and from other third parties from uh, tampering with the data. So, yeah. Well, Thank you very much. You guys have been a very active audience. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.